So there's one in so-called Lausitz with different locations in Dresden, Belzo, and Hayaswerda. We're talking about trying to understand how to make drones, coordinate the drones or drones operate in a certain way, how to make sure that we have driving, construction, and these kind of um, applications up and running. So we're, we have a fully automated construction site where everything is remote controlled and, and these kind of things. In, uh, in another test bed, we have, uh, as you see here, or in this test bed, we have one in Welzo and one in Hoyerswerda, one site. And um, the different partners that are involved are listed here with their logos. And you see, we really have a nice fun Hello? bunch of different partners being active. Obviously in the construction area, what we're really trying to understand is how can collaborative connected machines operate and do things? Um, how can we basically just have the connectivity and how does that help on its own? And then really, let's say, call it like almost a 3D printer, but not a 3D printer as one machine, but really have the, the different operational units make sure that we get some automated um, construction. Um, just to give you an idea here, this is the view, the point of view. You can see it here in, uh, in the, let me show you with the presenter. Uh, so we, in this view, we have basically, this is what we see from a cockpit point of view. You can see here, this is the construction site with all the different parts. And then we can really see what's happening. We can animate and we can simulate this. We can do this in real time. And then as you see, there is no human sitting here uh, on this, um, on this um, excavator anymore, but this is really fully automated. In the agricultural test bed, it's about trying to really get automated robotics like this kind of an in situation happening here in terms of uh, test, testing this in agriculture. So that we have a whole another bunch of partners that are involved in this. We're really trying to understand where another bunch of partners that are involved in this. We're really trying to understand where, what are the different opportunities and possibilities to have this kind of test up and running? Finally, let's look at this. Um, here we see that we do have uh, in the Landnetz also some ultra short range, short range, mid range, long range, ultra long range kind of capabilities that we're looking at. So in the end, it's about building this little agricultural campus networks connecting to the infrastructure. And if there's no local connectivity, use cellular. And if a cellular is not available, use satellite then to connect to the, uh, that's why you see here also the satellite connection to ensure that we have this level of connectivity. And in the end, we really want to improve the growing, the picking, the harvesting and the whole basically working on the on in a farm in an orchard whatever all vineyard to make sure that we have these kind of applications in a very specific way and also as you can see here in the middle in in the soil embed sensors that communicate and that we can use also to have this kind of automation on the campus side it's about making campus life basically um, autonomous or let's say enhancing the campus life, for example, of the university campus or other things in this way as we know. So the good news is we have a whole nice set of 18 partners that we currently work with as the 5G Lab Germany, but within the project, we have more than 50 or 80 partners in total uh, that are working with us on these different topics and uh, making this whole vision of remote controlled robotics as we had it with a tactile internet happen. So if we put this in perspective, if we put this in perspective, what we learn is our vision is 1G to 6G of, tele of network. 1G, 2G was televoice. 3G, 4G was data. 5G, 6G is 
remote control of objects, the tactile internet. So if we look at this here, we can see we always need two generations, two generations, two generations. And what is so interesting is the second generation had a complete new radio access network. The fourth generation had a complete new radio access network. So the sixth generation might again have a complete new radio access network. And I can give you examples why I truly believe that's going to happen. Because this, we had 2G CDMA networks and we have 3G CDMA. We have 4G L OFDM and we have 5G OFDM. So the radio access network revolution happens exactly at this border. And why is that? And what is so interesting? Because 1G was about addressing business customers, 2G the consumer, 3G business smartphones, 4G the consumer. Um, 5G, I showed you the different application scenarios. So they're all not consumer applications, but business applications. And then always sort of a half generation before the even we then see sort of consumer stuff happening. happening. So then consumers pop up and consumers will then actually make sure that mobile robotics will be available for the consumer. What would these applications be? I mean, this is of course a, a European point of view. Uh, the one thing is for kids and grown-ups that want to play, be entertained and learn things. So you want to do like sports kind of gaming, kind of interaction where you have objects and want to make them of course mobile. If you look at this, this ball machine, if you have a tennis ball machine, it's not mobile. You shove it somewhere and then it's always the ball is coming from the same machine that you just don't know in which direction the ball is going to be flying. But you want this to be whizzing over the court as well. Uh, here's the same thing. This is not mobile. And Peloton is a nice idea, but not mobile. You're always sitting there in your own thing. So that is the one thing. The second thing, of course, we want to make our daily life, our course, more easy with having robots helping us, our butlers, our mobile robots helping us in some way, from cooking to cleaning to cleaning up to whatever else, to washing, have robotics help our make our life nicer and easier. And finally, as we become impaired, that can be in a younger age or older age, and we need a walker or, or even our, like this person here is uh, paralyzed, um, we want to then use exoskeleton to run around like little kids. And this is a picture I took of this person, he's paralyzed and he can walk around now already with an exoskeleton. Of course, this now has to have a ton of sensors and wireless communication because you walk around corners, you want to see around corners, you don't want to hurt or harm anybody because you of course become a Superman if you wear these kind of exoskeleton. Now, where do we see some limitations in 5G, which makes it really a problem. And one thing is cost. Yes, because 5G obviously is this new application field of tactile internet, remote control of robotics and virtual reality. And for this, an augmented reality. And for this, basically, um, first it was important to make sure that we can deliver the functionality. And 6G will be about making this at a lower cost by using dynamics in the in the performance um, so that we can adapt to the performance as needed and only pay for the um, high cost of low latency and high reliability in those couple of seconds during which we are traveling or during which the robot really needs this kind of uh, requirement whereas if we're slowing down and whatever all, we don't need this kind of cost. And then also make use of that, that the hardware cost, of course, is also fully adaptive. The other thing that we can think of is uh, why do we see this big change in cost? And, uh, this is something we're doing in front of uh, our cluster of excellence city, as well as in the collaboration with Facebook. As an example, um, it is about real, humans interacting with robots. And what is the challenge? Obviously, if a real human wants to tell a robotics, we need a reliability of something, that's one thing. But 
we need a reaction time, a latency of one to 10 milliseconds. Depending upon the environment, it's one millisecond or 10 milliseconds for the application. Now, this is a challenge, as we know, because the speed of light is only 200 kilometers per millisecond over fiber optic cable. So that means already the cable is a bit of a problem. So that's why we have to look at taking model predictive control into account, taking basically a digital twin. So a real person and its motion and its reaction can be tracked and learned by a model. The same thing, the machine, every machine, of course, from a control point of view has a model. Now this model can be exported to the other side and then we have the model at the other side. And then in the human machine interaction, we know what the robot is gonna be doing in the next 10 milliseconds and the robot knows what the human is going to be doing in the 10 milliseconds because we cannot jerk with infinite speed. And then we can interact with this model at one to 10 milliseconds, but communication can be lossy, and at way lower latency, up to 100 times slower in the latency. And this makes this cost effective. And that is where the high cost that we currently incur with 5G tactile internet applications will be democratized so that every single corner on planet Earth can actually afford this kind of scenarios. So we can really then live with a flaky channel and um, far more than 10 milliseconds latency because we have a close connection with the model and the model only needs to be synchronized with the reality once in a while. Let's have a look at that. What does that entail in some specific scenarios? Um, we have to look at this in terms of communication control co-design. So I have a team working on this. Look, let's look at what Arturo is doing. You were talking about this kind of model predictive control over a lossy and packet lossy latency prone wireless link and in the, tense, in the sense of adaptive cruise control. We have a platoon of cars. Each car measures by radar what's happening up front and that's what we have today in cars. Um, we can improve this a lot with cooperative adaptive cruise control. And the question is, what are the latencies that are requirement and when does this tow thing become stable? At what kind of, if even this communication link is lossy, if we just communicate the speed of the car in front of us directly. Um, so the question is, what is the maximum allowed time interval for communicating and which is the same as the latency for this to think to become stable. Now, interestingly, if we have these cars in a traditional way, just using radar, the first car, for example, in this example, decelerates from 120 kilometers an hour to 117, three kilometers per hour, that's nothing, in two seconds. That's really a very slow reaction. And you can see the second car, third car, fourth car, all the way up to the 10th car in this platoon starts oscillating like crazy, if we were only to rely on radar. This is what we call a chaotic buildup of this kind of a system. This is not so-called string stable. However, if we were to communicate the speed of the car, the velocity of the car with a wireless link, then we can make this very stable as you can see here. Even if it's packet lossy. And here just some examples, here we can see that um, in 3GPP, in the standardization, um, the end-to-end -end latency that is required for this platooning application is 10 milliseconds. And this maximum allowed time interval, the MATI is also 10 milliseconds. However, if we take our approaches and see if we extend this, for example, with 0.4 second headway time, which means the time between the front bumper reaching the position of the of the following car of reaching the position of the rear bumper of the car in front of the following car. Um, which means here, look here, we can go in certain constellation into a couple hundred milliseconds. 
all the way up to more than 100, maybe even 500, 600 milliseconds. So this is 10x up to nearly 100x, almost two orders of magnitude, more latency that is we allow with this kind of situation. Um, and on the packet loss side, we can see here also situations where we can get one, two, maybe all the way up to two and a half orders of magnitude. That means what is written in the standard that we need 99.99% packet error rate, uh, packet reliability rate, only uh, 10 to the minus four packet error rate, can be way greatly relaxed to 1%, possibly even reaching in further two in this kind of system to 10%. Kernel tuning is, is what Andres is doing. So here we're really looking at um, estimating not only, not only sending the speed, but really giving the state models uh, full information to the following car and estimating the full state of the control system of the following car. And then we can improve even by yet another order of magnitude. Now let's look at this. What does this mean for winged drones? Um, this, in the one case, it was cars in a two-dimensional space on the ground. Now we're going into the air. And there we have a big problem because it's a three-dimensional space. And we have, so that's the position, but the orientation of the drone, which way it's going, is another three-dimensional problem. And then the acceleration is another three-dimensional problem. And the, uh, so another three-dimensional problem in space as well as three-dimensional problem in orientation. So this is quite a few dimensions. And the same thing that we have here is of course, now we don't have a static environment, the street does not move, but we have wind or we're being blown around with turbulences. And so the question is, how can we have accurate flight state estimation without expensive sensors, just with GPS, a pitot tube, and a couple other things um, to find out where we are? Interesting, so far, these um, Estimators, all that you have in airplanes, all rely on mag magnetometers. And uh, this is a really a challenge because we know the Earth's magnetic field changes as we fly around. It's not completely linear. And the second problem is since the Earth's magnetic field is so weak, if you just have a smartwatch on and you're close to the magnetometer, you're in trouble. Or if it's a drone that picks up a package and flies around and in the package is a piece of metal, there's a challenge. So we really have to make sure that we can do these very, very precise without expensive sensors and without a magnetometer. And this has not been done before, but here you can see that we have, can build an 18 state extended common filter. And based on this, we can actually fly around here some flight results from some glider planes. We use glider planes, not drones, to test this for winged um, systems. And we have very nice roll, pitch, and yaw uh, resolution. And we've actually managed to bring this into a new measure, a new um, system that is provided by AlexNav so that you can fly around and really have this very precise wind estimate. Why is the wind estimate so important? If you think of a drone constellation and you have like two drones flying along in a formation or even one drone in a very narrow kind of situation, you really have to know where, what the wind is. And wind is the hardest thing to estimate these days and the angle of attack. So that means the angle of your aircraft versus the wind, which is, as you know, the 737 max problem that the angle of attack estimation was wrong. So this where, is where we really showed some very nice results such that we can make this happen. And finally also uh, then bring this into a formation, which is EFAS job, so that we can then actually have formations of drones take on tasks that are way beyond the typical. Here are some um, publications uh, that we've done. So what you see, what is really important 
is we can take the millisecond, I have five milliseconds, I should actually put 50 milliseconds here. We can take this very harsh millisecond requirement and completely relax this. We can take a very harsh reliability requirement with a packet rate of like 10 to the minus six to 1% or two or, or a couple percent packet error rate with these kind of smarter ways of building communication control code requirements. And by doing so, let me go back, we then can make this cost effective and applicable to the broad audience and not only to the commercial users that we have today, but really make this kind of pennyware that everybody can afford this on planet Earth. And this is sort of a little bit of the idea. And in the end, we will have these kind of collaborative robots all over the place for health, for guided surgery, immersive experience, driving, industry, agriculture, whatever. And this probably will be then how these packets are then communicated and what is then done will probably load our networks. Now, what is important to understand is that, yes, these applications have to be able to run in such a way that we have this kind of functionality available to enable personal mobile robotics, but we still need some additional functionality. So important is cost down, cost down, cost down, cost down. Otherwise it's not gonna be a consumer product and not for everybody on planet Earth. And this is what we really want. But we also have to look at what else is the cost on problem. And there we have to think of wireless radio sensing because not only must these mobile robots communicate, they also have to sense. What are the senses that we know? These are just some senses that we know. Human and non-human senses. Now, in the first level, 5G tactile internet, we've addressed quite a bit of it, but we have not addressed, we cannot taste, we cannot smell, and we cannot echolocate. We need this to understand our ambient environment. And this is where really we have to look at, and this is where a lot of innovation has to happen in 6G, and where we will have, I think, a new radio access network to do sensing, radio sensing, as well as communication in one environment. So not only like in this kind of situation, the left situation where you're driving along, there's tumbleweed, your normal radar sensor that you need has to be integrated to wireless communication sensor because you don't want to pay for an additional sensor and radar is not cheap. And it also doesn't only have to have the functionality of seeing an object, it has to also understand, it has to smell and taste, meaning understand the object and see, this is tumbleweed, I can move forward. It's safe to move forward slowly but surely. Or in the virtual world or augmented world, I don't want to wear these funky gloves, I just want to use my hand as an input device and that's why for gesture detection, I need to have not only understanding that the, the leaves behind me are wiggling of some plant, but that actually, this is my hand. So it has to not only see this is, a, this is moving the hand, but it also has to see that there is some, uh, that it is a hand and not something else. And so if we put this together, this means we really have cool situation where we can use one radio to either sense or communicate or do both and really trade off, sensing as a service. And this is not putting an additional radar system into something and asking for money for yet another system, but we want to make it as cheap as wireless communication and do sensing for at least the consumer parts and for most consumer applications in such a way that it's affordable and available for everybody on planet. 
Now, the good news is already 5G is giving us some basic technology because 4G, we are the cell um, site for typically cut into three sectors, 120 degree pizzas, and each antenna would illuminate one's whole sector to communicate with the terminal that is sitting in one position. In 5G, we use antenna arrays and massive MIMO to already do beam forming so that we whisper into that direction and don't illuminate everything. So we already know something about directivity. And this is super important. So we have, we can already resolve directivity, which we couldn't do. This also, of course, makes it may, way more efficient. Now, if we take this into account and see that we can actually see a terminal from multiple base stations, then we can do way more precise geolocation. Always in those cases where we need the geolocation in addition to GPS or GPS is not available at that precision. But we can also pinpoint our beam in a direction and we can communicate uh, or with, with an object, or we can also com not communicate, but just sense an object that is standing in there and see what the reflection is, either as a base station or as a terminal. The base station most likely will more, not only sense the environment, but of course also active drones in the air. Whereas the terminal, this could be some robot running around on a field, it needs to know is there something in the way or not and we can actively use this and we can of course use this also in this kind of passive radar so that means radio sensing is really truly important and it's a new quality because we need to be able to understand what are the different tiers of sensing and of information buildup that we can generate that way without having to run around and have Google street maps or whatever kind of cars all over the place, which only happens in uh, rich communities, but not necessarily all over planet Earth. And that's where we have to see why, how can this be done and how do terminals and terminals and networks and terminals exchange information. So the first thing is, of course, we do raw RF sensing. What do we gather? We gather something like a radar map, but also a spectroscopic map. So we can find out in this area, there's a lot of trees, in these areas, it's very dry and sandy or whatever. Else. So we, uh, we, we can do even materials analysis. We can even find out, is there a gas leak in from the factory and the cloud is, the gas cloud is moving along. So it is not only objects, but it's also their composition. What are they made up of? And uh, with this, we can just basically take all the sensors, load this into the network and be happy. But that of course is a huge amount of data because not only do we have a static environment, but we have dynamically objects moving around. Um, but even, for the static part, it makes sense um, to do some imaging and some pre-processing so that we can actually send not only the raw data, but pre-process data so that uh, reduce the amount of information for getting a static field of what the world is like. But then we also have the dynamic objects. And these dynamic objects means every sensor can do some cognition and have cognitive pre-processing such that we have a static map, let's say of spectroscopic analysis of the material. And then we see this cloud of gas moving along. So they, we have a cognitive element that the sensor, the RF sensor can actually find out there is this gas cloud. I can I recognize this and I can detect this as a mobile object that is running on a static map. And this together, then is of course a huge value because we know we can track fire, we, we can track uh, mobile robotic objects, cars, whatever you want to uh, track. Maybe even there's a, 
migration of animals in the national park or whatever. And uh, you can see that through the network and actually then based on that, build your intelligence. And the whole idea is we need this in one radio access network. And once we have that in one radio access network, it will be cheap, it will be available for everybody on planet Earth, no matter if they have millions of availables or pennies. And uh, that's why we started this article symposium on joint communication and sensing. It was this year was the first year. Next year, it is March 9 to 10 in, um, in Austria, in Innsbruck. And yes, it will have snow. And uh, you see the different topics that are covered. So I want to really invite everybody that is interested and excited about this field, um, jump on this bandwagon. It's gathered a huge community of a couple thousand people already. And um, that's why this is something that will happen. There we do see a huge momentum built up in the wireless community for building the new radio access, access network of the future for 6G that will democratize the tactile internet, mobile robotics, because it will become from a sensing communication point of view, very cheap. If we look at this now in the context of maybe some ideas, now these are just my little ideas as a little professor in Germany. And I've only had a couple of visits to Africa. So excuse me if I'm looking at this from a little bit of a naive point of view, but I think you have to see that Africa, I do think has a unique position that enables it to come up with opportunities, business models, products that are way beyond the imagination of many other people. If we look, for example, at food production, we do want to increase food production, not only in Africa, but many countries, and the productivity. What do we need? We want to optimize the use of pesticides, only use them there where they're needed, and as early as possible, not after the damage has been done. Secondly, we want to fertilize, but we don't want to over-fertilize. We only want to fertilize as much as needed. So we need a dynamic system, robots running through the fields, drone flying around. So do this and understand where we are. The same thing with irrigation. These might be walking robots walking through the fields with a bag of water that then just irrigate those plants in with that amount of water that is needed at the optimal point and not some big sprinkler system that squirts the water all over the place. Number four, we want to improve harvesting. What does that mean? Well, if you look at harvesting, let's say, of many crops, if the strawberries or whatever it is are ripe, you go in there and harvest the field. Now, this is, makes no sense because what you really want to do is you want to go to the field or apple orchards or whatever. You want to go to the field and harvest continuously over four weeks time. Instead of that, you harvest your potatoes, your whatever, all at a point in time when you think it's an optimum based on your Gaussian bell curve or whatever, all of when the different crops are getting ready. So some crop is overly ripe, some is not ripe enough yet. So you have a whole mix of that. It would be much better to harvest in a continuous fashion over a month and only pick, I always thought that part. That is right, because if we do that, then we can also improve the field to market efficiency. Because right now in a lot of countries, up to 50% of the harvest is lost between picking down the field and the kitchen in the people's home because it goes bad on the way. So there's a whole big chance of at least double the food production if we bring automation help into this part and it has to come at a cost that is cheap enough for every corner of planet earth and it has to be not 
replacing humans, but in such a way that assists humans such that it's acceptable and is really something as a great benefit for us all. Wouldn't that be great? Because we could easily feed 20 billion people on planet Earth, not that we want to become 20 billion, but we could easily feed a lot of people with the amount of fields that we have today if we were able to do it right. And this is what 5G and 6G is about. Next example would be, for example, environment and using 5G, 6G to be more, to, to change a lot in our environment. If you look at this, um, this is for example Lake Tana in Ethiopia that is completely over, overgrown by hyacinth. And you would like to not only take that out, which you can do once with a big boat, but then as soon as you see new sprouts by flying over to with drones, you want to right away attack it, pick it out, and, and make sure that it doesn't become such a big problem. So this is obviously another area where we can use mobile robotics because it's so cumbersome, you cannot have helicopters fly over there, that's way too expensive. But if we had cheap drones that could fly, observe and tell another helicopter, uh, another drone come as a, like a wind drone that is very cost effective and then a copter drone that is a little more expensive um, to come in and pick as soon as the, uh, it sees that something is wrong happening there, then you don't need any chemicals to fight this and it's very quickly done. Certainly also another area would be for conservation and tourism. So you would like to make sure that you have, uh, because I mean, it's a great job for rangers, but it would be nicer if the ranger would not have to take out the saw and dehorn a rhino so that it's not going to be killed. But if you were able to really observe this with 5G, with drones, with 6G, in such a way that we can protect the environment, protect the animal, conserve uh, wildlife. And by doing so, actually, this is a big enabler of tourism because, of course, a dehorned rhino is also for tourists not as interesting as a rhino with horns, as an example. And of course, not to forget uh, logistics, meaning controlling remote areas connecting remote areas. Because, I mean, you can use drones for not only monitoring uh, um, wildlife and wildfires and whatever all, but also for packet delivery. So that internet shopping is cost effective in every corner on planet Earth. Medical supplies can be brought there, um, schooling supplies, whatever all. Um, as you can see here, the First Nation in the lower Copter there is an example of something that's active today already. So that remote First Nation uh, members in Canada can be completely connected to the, um, to the logistic infrastructure of Canada. Not like before where once a week or once a month, some boat would come by or a plane would fly and now they can really be part of the community as they like. So in conclusions, I see huge opportunity for really making sure that a wireless infrastructure and the airspace can overcome any other missing land-based infrastructure if the cellular network is up and running. Um, we see that we now are at the step taking tactile internet applications, as I showed in our different test beds, from business, understanding what are the requirements, and maybe already have a first 5.5G upgrade of 5G that incorporates a lot of this, so that we can, with 6G, can really make life better in every corner of planet Earth, and not only in um, those areas that currently are better served. And this would be a huge step up because suddenly it doesn't matter where you are, 
you're connected and as soon as you're connected you have the fencing the connectivity logistics everything available and are part of the international community and are not interested in moving around with this i would like to end my presentation and thank you for listening and um i really wish that we all can embrace this and have a better future. thank you very much Thank you very much, Professor Fertuis, for a very informative keynote address. And we'd like to apologize for miscommunication uh, that led uh, you not being able to start your presentation on time. Uh, the floor now is open for questions. Prof, can you hear? Prof cannot hear us, so we have to type out our questions. Okay. All right. So the floor is open. Let's let's uh, send questions. Hello. Hello? Anything? Um, <laughs> typing. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he had issues with his mic. Yeah, so I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, continue to hear me. So what I think is really important is uh, we currently have many areas on planet Earth that are not connected to the typical land-based infrastructure, roads, train tracks, these kind of things, shipping or whatever all. And so what I think with 5G, it will start and with 6G, it will be really becoming nice with this tactile internet idea of remote controls. It really doesn't matter anymore where you live. You can then decide to become a member of the international internet community or whatever you wanna call it. And you can have access, you can basically have access to the perks. That means if you want to know if you're safe in your little house, wherever you are, be it in the remote areas of California, in, in somewhere in Asia or in Africa, um, you can find out quickly by connecting or starting your own, uh, flying your own drone and these kind of things, connecting 
is there a fire around you? Are you safe? What is the situation here? Is there going to be some flooding and these kind of things? So from the environmental safety all the way to activity in an economic as becoming a member of the international economic community, you are completely safe and can become part of that. Um, not in the way that we are now, because now basically, yes, you can have bits and bytes act access. Let's assume you have bits and bytes access, but you don't have access to tangible goods. And when you become part of this kind of vision, you will have access to tangible goods and you will even improve your life, meaning the productivity of your agriculture um, and other kind of activities in such a way that um, you can do that. And I think really one of the major points between 5G and 6G, it's like between 3G and 4G, um, when 3G was introduced, video telephony cost here in Germany two euro fifty per minute. Now, what we're doing right now doesn't cost two euro fifty per minute, right? So this is a video conferencing system. So obviously, what you can see is it's been a great improvement. And between 3G and 4G, because in 4G we can do these kind of things, in 3G we couldn't. It would be too expensive. So we will have the same thing here. In 5G, it's expensive still for these kind of robotics applications, but in 6G, it will be available. So even if you are elderly and you're in a your remote area, you will just have your exoskeleton, your level, whatever, all to help you out and make sure that you can stay there and don't have to move hundreds of kilometers away into some uh, assisted living place to torn out of your community. Um, and these kind of things, I think, will make our life much better. Now, so from the, we have to, as cellular communication technologists and sensor people, we have to make sure that this part will be cast down, down to nothing. Because as we know, the robotic style, the tangible part of the robots will always still cost something. But in a mass produced environment, this also will be at some cost level, finally, that it is accessible for everybody. So I think, yes, we will see this first happening 2025 in, let's say, more developed uh, or let's say richer areas, um, more developed areas in Africa, more developed areas in Europe, more developed and richer areas wherever you are. And, um, and then, over the 10 years until 2035, we will see cost on cost on cost on like crazy. And that is where I see a huge chance because that is where, think of it this way. If you talk to an equipment provider today and tell them, guys, half of the world population does not have true up-to-date broadband internet access, then they say, well, there's no business in this gallery. And I say, there is a business if you would embrace it. If you're, you were to embrace it, there would be a business and you could actually produce things that are there and are available. And I think the ingenuity, at least the Africans I've known, uh, uh, of many people in the African continent is amazing. And so with this ingenuity and the capabilities of what 5G and 6G will make available, um, I think there will be products invented, services invented that can basically become basic world dominating. Um, just like uh, uh, social networking has become world dominating. So that's why I truly think this is a huge opportunity because you can only come up with the ideas in these markets if you personally experience the need yeah, me sitting here in my nice office in Dresden, Germany, I don't know what is the situation in the boonies in Northern Finland or in Tanzania or wherever. So that's why I truly think there is a huge chance for Africa to come up with its ideas because 50% of the world population lives in that situation. And that's not small market-wise.
Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so the question is, if we have big OEM dominate and telling us we're only interested in serving 50% of the world population, um, we will continue with this kind of a divide. Now, if you look at what's happening in Oran already and other kind of similar activities, I think we will see a programmability of the networks or a flexibility of the networks that go, will go way beyond what we're used to today. So um, today we have a situation where we have a dominating chipset manufacturer that is very interested in making things as complex as possible because the more complicated it is, the more difficult it is for new entrants to come in. Same thing on, on the infrastructure side. So I truly think that there is also a chance here by embracing possibly ORAN in some field tests. We're doing that here as well, honestly. And, and saying, guys, I'm not interested in these 10,000 features. 10 are enough. You can cut down the complexity and come up with your own kind of solutions that are way more cost effective without having all the bells and whistles of the features of the standard that are currently in there. And this is something I think one has to think out of the box because right now the standards are dominated let's or driven by companies and by interest parties whose main, whose, not main, but a big interest of them is to make the standards a big, huge compromise, adding all people's input and saying, let's put this all into the feature list to be such one big compromise party. That's what 3GPP is. And by doing so, it very well serves the interest of keeping others out. Now, if you take your downscaled ORAN solution, that there is no ORAN solution that is full feature. They're all this part of feature set. So, and you take this kind of thing, then you can actually show things. Like I've worked with a decade or two years ago, two decades ago with um, Mazdar, uh, uh, IIT, uh, Chennai, in Chennai, yes, so uh, in India. And they were working on something similar and they built GSM base stations just using a PC. Uh, so our softwareized solution based on the PC and it didn't have all features, but who cares? It was good enough to serve the needs of India so that everybody had voice and data at some kind of service that is, was way better than what they had before. And in the end, this last little mew of service that maybe is interesting for some big corporate in, in, in Germany or in the US, who cares about it in, if you're somewhere in a village in Germany, in Tanzania or somewhere else. So that's why what I think is really important is if we embrace this ORAN movement from that point of view, not thinking of it as something where we always have to think of the full feature set, but say, this is an opportunity to just concentrate on these three, four basic services that make us really happy. Voice, reasonable data, and remote controls in some kind of category level. Then we can roll out these networks much simpler. And that is, I think, an opportunity also for new OEMs to pop up that really come with the right feature set as needed in the environment that they experience themselves in their neighborhood, in their country, in their region, in their continent. And so once again, just like I said before, with the new kind of social networking and, and applications on the, on the application side, robotic side, I think the same holds for the network side. And if we embrace activities like ORAN in the right way and drive them in, not the standardization, that's gonna become more and more complicated, but take it as a subset and use that subset. Then we're talking, think of Wi-Fi. 802.11 is a humongous standard. 
But then there is the Wi-Fi Alliance that defines those few things that need to be done and that are tested. So we can do something similar. You could have a 5G Africa Alliance or 6G Africa Alliance and maybe team up with whatever other regions and say, guys, let's cut this down into the feature set that is really interesting. And based on that, start our own activity. I think that's your chance. You're more than welcome. That's a very good question. So what I was trying to show is, um, so the question is, will 6G still be defined by the very low latency and very high speed gigabit per second? I think what I try to show is that many applications don't need that, especially from the consumer side. Yes, but even agriculture and other applications. Yes, there will be, industrial robotics applications that need the millisecond or below millisecond latency and whatever. The good news is if we do the right model predictive control, networking this together in such a way as I showed, we can reduce latency, we can reduce the requirements on the packet array, and we can re reduce the bandwidth as well. That's also a third part that I didn't mention okay, in my talk. So um, yes, 6G will of course be defined by even higher data rates. And some people are talking about 0.1 millisecond and these kind of things. Yes, but that will not be the broad consumer application space. I don't think so, at least. So why are we thinking of today? And, um, and that's why I think one, that's what I mentioned with this 6G Africa or whatever you want to call it. If you are coming from your requirements and we're learning a lot and I'm more than happy to talk to you guys in more detail on that from our test beds. We were running, as I mentioned, 10 test beds on 5G campus network and see what is really required of this gigantic spec and what has been over-designed. Um, that's, this is nothing to say that the engineers didn't do a fantastic job. The standards is a fantastic piece of work. But I mean, at that time, the applications could not be anticipated. Now we're learning. And um, so this is where I think we can see a lot happening. And um, where, of course, there will be people talking about 100 gigabit per second. People are talking about one terabit per second for 60. Um, and things like that, and 0.1 millisecond. I think for the big consumer application, I can take that scare away. You don't have to be high speed, full speed driver to really make use of the main part of it. It will be more on other things that really bring the cost up so, and that make it really available for everyone. That's my way of thinking at least. And that's your chance. Uh, Luzanga, you can talk because the rest of the audience can hear you. Oh, okay. All right. So any, any more questions from the floor? Costas, as usual. <laughs> Interesting talk on the on the area networks uh, hubs. I believe you, you, have, you have some questions on that regard. Costas? 
Uh, no, no, not this time, but the, the presentation was uh, great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Joyce, you have your experimental network in the Karoo. Any questions? Uh, not at this moment, but I, I, I concur with what Prof said about um, the need for low latency has been overhyped as many applications can be still facilitated with um, without having that that capability in the networks, um, which is something we definitely will not have when we launch a network in the career. <laughs> Yeah, that is very important uh, uh, aspect because when 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 one reads those specs for five G, you just lose interest. You feel like you're hopeless. You can't reach those. While we have so many other applications that that they don't really need that kind of latency, and uh, a large number of population uh, who, who are in need of uh, broadband communication. So I, I think this 6G uh, network will bring all of those uh, issues on reality. Okay, so Joyce, you, you, you are the session host, I believe. Um, what, what do we do we still take more questions from, from, from the audience or I hear you now, by the way. Oh, okay. Here <laughs> <Yeah>, you know. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, I have no more questions from the audience, but um, I'd like to thank Prof for sticking around and still giving his keynote. It was very interesting, I think, to the three of us being in communications research. Uh, we probably enjoyed it the most, I would say. <laughs> Great, then I say goodbye now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for- Sorry for not being in Tanzania, it would be so much fun. It's a country I have not visited yet. <laughs> yeah, um, we all wished we were there. <laughs> yes, uh, next time. Okay, thank you. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.